flex route in in uh, Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, back in December, uh, part of the 80th anniversary of the uh, Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. And one of the reasons for that is because in this war, which most Americans have really never heard of, uh, it, it set a lot of the trends for great power confrontation in the Pacific leading up to World War II, the most obvious one being how the Japanese actually started the war with the surprise attack on the Russian naval base and uh, Pacific squadron at Port Arthur. And I've got lots of maps, so uh, you'll be geographically oriented. Uh, since, uh, as I say, most people are not that familiar with the geography of the era. So there are other things that come out of this case study. And one of the points I like to make uh, when I give this lecture is there were a lot of lessons about how modern industrial warfare was going to play out if people had just paid attention to them. Uh, for example, the power of artillery, uh, the effect of machine guns, uh, what was going to happen when you had mass citizen armies uh, on great extended battlefields. Unlike say 100 years earlier with uh, the Napoleonic War, where the battlefield, you could literally look across and see the whole battlefield at once. Well, in the 20th century, uh, battlefields would literally be hundreds or in some cases, a thousand miles wide. So uh, that lesson was just simply not, uh, not brought aboard. Uh, the importance of the full mobilization of public opinion uh, and of the economy. Uh, and one of the big, big uh, takeaways from uh, this particular conflict is how does a weaker power, at least an ostensibly weaker power in terms of the usual uh, categories of military superiority, like numbers of troops, numbers of ships, that sort of thing. How does that weaker power actually defeat a stronger power? And uh, one of the interesting aspects uh, of the, uh, all the wars that have occurred over the last say 200, 250 years, about a third of them have eventually been won by what was ostensibly the weaker power. This is certainly one of them. Uh, the American War of Independence would be another one. And so when you look at that dynamic, this is a, a very interesting uh, case study. Uh, and it fits nicely into the, the rise and fall of empires theme uh, in the sense of here you really see the rise of Imperial Japan uh, by the uh, turn of the uh, uh, 19th through the 20th century. So with that, off we go. Alrighty. Uh, I've said I use a lot of maps and um, here's one of them. This is the Chinese empire at its height uh, in the 1790s. And the point I'm going to make here over the next uh, few slides, next few minutes is that the the very quick collapse of Imperial China created a power vacuum in the region that allowed the Imperial powers. And remember, this is the 19th century, so the, the great age of, uh, of colonialism, imperialism, uh, particularly in terms of trade and along the, the coast here, but also it opened up Manchuria and this region here in Korea uh, to uh, imperial exploitation. And that is the dynamic that ultimately uh, brought the Japanese and the Russians uh, into this conflict. Manchuria, even today, is the most heavily industrialized and the most resource rich area of all of uh, what we call China. Uh, of course, back then it would include Mongolia, Tibet, um, and down into uh, uh, the area that is uh, Burma, Thailand, that area. So obviously Manchuria is gonna be a big target and domination of Manchuria, uh, particularly in the uh, industrial age is gonna be very, very important. So the, the collapse of Chinese imperial power, uh, but particularly between about 1840 and 1900 is really going to spark a lot of uh, conflict between the colonial powers or competition between the colonial powers and uh, it's also going to be aided by the pretty dramatic and radical transformation of uh, these societies in the industrial age. 
So now you had things like the ability of a naval force to stay on station or to establish distant station and not be tied down to the, the home country. Uh, it also meant that these uh, industrial states were now uh, bureaucratized and centralized uh, such that you could rationally uh, conduct a war. And by rational, I don't mean it was a smart thing to do, just that you had the bureaucratic stu structures and the command and control structure to be able to conduct uh, major industrial wars at a distance. And of course, this was the age of the mass conscription armies. So, so battles were going to be uh, pretty huge and bloody affairs. So uh, there actually was the, uh, the emperor that dominated China at its height right there. I won't even attempt to pronounce his name, but um, very clearly the collapse of uh, Imperial China, certainly by the beginning of the 20th century, uh, actually created that power vacuum into which Russia, especially in Japan, saw opportunity to expand their colonial holdings or domination. Uh, the Russians, particularly into Manchuria and Japan into uh, Korea. So uh, contests were dominating uh, between these two countries into what had been clearly part of the uh, Chinese empire. So what causes this collapse of the Chinese uh, empire, particularly the economy? Massive inflation, uh, particularly in terms of silver, which was the major uh, uh, trade item um, or uh, thing of value. That's what they used was silver, massive inflation in silver. And of course, anytime that happens, you don't have to be an economist to know, uh, you start getting disruptions in the uh, consumer, particularly the food commodity uh, area. And this is particularly bad when you have an agrarian economy, which is what China was. So you had a whole series of civil wars and rebellions. I'll cite one that'll, that'll really surprise you. Between 1848 and 1864, there was a thing called the Taipang Rebellion. 30 to 60 million people died. Now, not all by combat, probably mostly from famine and disease created by the collapse of the economy. Massive disruptions in that agrarian economy. Taipang Rebellion. Another thing that uh, really aided, uh, if that's even the right word, uh, certainly uh, added to the, the Chinese problem was the, uh, the whole thing of opium, the opium trade. And there was uh, between 1839 and, and 42, was a series of what were known as opium wars between the British empire and uh, Imperial China. And what was this all about? Well. Opium uh, was at the time a legal product and uh, the monopoly, pretty much the monopoly on the opium trade uh, was in British hands, not only in coming out of Afghanistan, which as you know, is a, a major producer of the poppy plant, uh, but also in parts of China. Well, the Chinese government saw that this was a real problem. So they had their version of the, of the drug wars 200 years ago uh, and they tried to stop it because what was happening was a lot of members of the imperial bureaucracy and of the military forces were becoming addicted to this opium and uh, you know what that's gonna to lead to. So um, essentially they tried to cut off the trade. Well, when that happened, uh, the British merchants uh, requested intervention and that led to a series of opium wars. And by the way, this is where as part of the, the um, negotiations and the peace treaty, uh, at the end of the war, this is where Britain got Hong Kong, or the 100-year lease, or 99-year lease, whatever it was on Hong Kong. But what it did was it began to break open the, uh, the markets uh, in, uh, in China. Now, pre previous to this, the, uh, the way you did business in China is a very closed type of uh, system. Canton, the city of Canton, was the only place where foreign merchants were allowed to trade with China. And so what would happen is the, the uh, uh, Chinese merchants would bring their products down to Canton and that's where the exchange or sale would be made with the uh, uh, commercial uh, entities there. And in fact, if you see these flags here, you can, you can identify these countries. There's of course the United States. Uh, that looks like Sweden. That's probably Norway maybe, 
or no, Denmark, I think. Um, there's Great Britain. So this was the trade port uh, where all these exchanges happened. And uh, essentially, uh, Westerners or foreigners were not allowed in them. Well, as a result of this series of wars, not only the opium wars uh, in the 1830s and 40s, uh, but war between Great Britain uh, and China and France and China in, in 1858 to 60, yet another round of war. The end result here was that uh, China was forced to open up several more trade ports. Or they were called treaty ports. Also forced to give missionary rights, missionary rights. And so this was when you began to see a lot of Christian missionaries uh, going in uh, to try to proselytize uh, the Chinese. But for our purposes, a big thing that came out of this, 1860, this is when Russia obtained Vladivostok. And Vladivostok today still is the home port for the uh, Russian, previously the Soviet Pacific fleet. So with that, 1860, now you begin to see the first movement of uh, the Russian Empire uh, into the Manchuria area. So not take a mental note, check, that's the first one, but a number of other things are gonna start happening. Well, there was a, another war, the Sino-French War, 1884, and this is where France actually got Vietnam and where Britain got Burma. Uh, then it was known as French Indochina, and um, of course we all remember the, uh, the Vietnam War occurring here, but it was a French colony up until uh, the uh, 1950s. So yet another whole uh, round of wars going on between the uh, diminishing Chinese empire. You see Burma here, that had been part of the empire, uh, leading up to pretty much the collapse of, uh, of imperial Chinese power uh, and creating that vacuum into which the uh, imperial powers jumped in. Well, now we get to the 1890s. What about Japan? Japan is going to now jump into the fray. And this is a very short war, a few months, uh, but this was uh, fought over Korea. Now, Korea uh, had been a client kingdom, I think is the best way to describe it, of the Chinese empire, uh, dominated by uh, China and foreigners were not, not allowed, basically. Well, there was a, a rebellion of sorts in Seoul uh, in what is now South Korea, and the Chinese uh, sent in troops to quell it. Well, the Japanese jumped on this as a provocation and landed 8,000 troops in Korea, uh, claiming that they were there to protect uh, Japanese citizens and interests. Well, probably there were only two Japanese citizens and a German shepherd uh, in Seoul at the time because it was a closed society. So really this was just a, a provocation for uh, Japan to jump in and to try to dominate uh, Korea. It led to full mobilization of uh, Japan. And it was a very short war. It was, uh, didn't last very long, uh, but the Chinese were thoroughly beat. And one of the big things that came out of this that's going to lead on to the uh, Russo-Japanese War is part of the settlement was China had to pay a 10-year indemnity, a very large indemnity. And it is with that money that the Japanese Imperial Navy was built. Uh, that is the money they used to purchase uh, essentially British warships to, uh, to staff their fleet. Uh, I, I like to throw this in. There's a very famous American in terms of naval lore. That, that is Philo Norton McGiffin. Uh, he was a, an American naval officer who was essentially hired by the um, uh, Chinese uh, Navy to try to to beef them up. Uh, he is the first American naval officer to actually command a modern battleship. It wasn't a U.S. Navy battleship, it was the Chinese Imperial Navy. Uh, nonetheless, he commanded it. Um, and he was, uh, well, you can see him there on the right. Uh, he didn't do too well out of one of the battles of the, uh, uh, of the war. Uh, nonetheless, um, uh, I like to throw up old Philo there because he's, he's sort of famous sort of famous naval officer. Well, as the imperial powers uh, began to move in and become more aggressive, uh, that set off the last of these internal rebellions called the Boxer Rebellion. 
of 1900. And the boxers uh, were, essentially it was a, an organic movement that was uh, trying to resist what they saw as the, uh, as the influence, the evil influences they saw it of the Christian missionaries uh, and, and of Western culture in general. Uh, so it was a, an uprising against that. And it led to what was known as 55 Days in Peking, which, by the way, was a great movie from the 1960s with Charlton Heston playing the American Marine Major, uh, Ava Gardner playing the uh, disgraced Russian Baroness, and uh, my favorite all-time actor, David Niven, playing the, uh, the head of all the collective imperial powers there uh, as the British representative. Well, what happened was in Peking, which is the capital city, it was the legation district or the embassy district. And it was a walled city within the city. And of course, every uh, uh, embassy had their own embassy guards. In our case, it was the, uh, the US Marines. Uh, and so when this uh, boxer rebellion essentially uh, attacked the legation and put it under siege for about 55 days. Well, why is this important? for our story here, because the Russians moved in a quarter of a million troops into Manchuria. So now they have complete domination of Manchuria and there's nothing the Chinese can do about it. One of the other things that came out of that Sino-Chinese War, uh, or Sino-Japanese War of 1894-95, was where did the money come from for that indemnity? Well, it was essentially loaned by the Russians. And so part of the deal here was the Russians got uh, rights in Manchuria, and they also got Port Arthur, which is going to play a huge role in our story. I'll talk about that very shortly. So the key point here, and to wrap this, this part of the lecture up, the collapse of that East Asian balance of power and of the Chinese imperial power, certainly as accelerated by the actions of the imperial powers, created that intense imperial conflict in the region and particularly uh, between the Russians and the Japanese. Uh, the Russians actually made great territorial and commercial gains with, with really minimal expenditure of blood and treasure. Um, the Japanese carved out their regional empire uh, by taking part in these conflicts. Um, and it, it, the conflict also taught a lot of lessons to the Japanese as to how to mobilize and organize their society for a, a modern industrial war. Uh, Russia missed a lot of those lessons. The Japanese did not, as you will see. All right. Well, the Americans had a hand in, in events in East Asia. There is Commodore Matthew Perry, a famous family here in Rhode Island. I think they're from East Greenwich, uh, was where they originated, but they're, they're certainly a Rhode Island family. And if this were a live class, I would ask who is his famous brother and everybody would raise their hand and say, well, of course, that's Oliver Hazard Perry. That's who he is, Naval Officer Commodore Matthew Perry. In the 1850s, he was given a squadron and uh, the orders were to essentially force open trade with, uh, with Japan. And it worked uh, because very quickly, the Japanese, looking across the water and seeing what was happening to China in the face of uh, these uh, industrialized imperial powers uh, and their pretty easy ability to just simply overwhelm China and grab pieces of it uh, or grab trade concessions. And so uh, as a result of the opening of Japan, which up till this point was pretty much a, still a feudal society, that was the shogunate period, if you know your Japanese history. Uh, and uh, it was the period of the Meiji, uh, Meiji constitution, where there was a, uh, an effort to essentially make Japan a, a westernized type of society. Uh, they, they transformed literally with a few decades their entire uh, uh, social, uh, economic life, culture from a very feudal oriental very xenophobic society uh, into one of the great powers by 1900, uh, certainly in the Pacific. A couple of things they did. Uh, first thing is they built their army and they said, well, look, we're gonna look across to Europe. And at that time, who is the dominant military land power? 
but it was France till 1871 when they got thrashed by the, the Prussians and Germans. So after 1871, um, Japanese modeled their, uh, their, their army and their military administration and, uh, and all after the Prussian model. So if you're going to build a Navy, which was the other growth uh, in military power that they, uh, uh, that they sought, you modeled after whom? Well, obviously the British Royal Navy. And uh, in fact, one of the uh, things uh, up until, I'm not sure when they, they cut it off, but certainly at least through World War I, uh, if you were a young Japanese uh, naval officer, part of your career advancement pattern would be to spend a couple of years serving with the British Royal Navy on a Royal Navy warship. Uh, Admiral Togo did this, uh, you're gonna see him shortly, and Admiral Yamamoto of World War II period uh, did that as well. Um, so you learn from the best, the Prussians for uh, army, for military land operations, uh, and the British Royal Navy for, uh, for your at sea. So the Japanese started building a fleet. And there is one of the very early uh, Japanese ships, uh, ironclad ships. I used to say that this was the very first one in the, in the Imperial Japanese Navy. And some student pulled me up short and said, ah, oh, no, 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 Professor Carpenter, it was the whatever. So my response was, okay, whatever. The point being here is you're seeing them start to build as early as the late 1860s um, towards a modern Iron Navy. And uh, then uh, as many of you know, you've seen me do a live presentation where I would pop out a, 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 a trivia question. So my trivia question here would be, can anybody tell me uh, what this ship was, how it started life? And I've never had anybody get it yet, but I'll tell you what it is. It was the former Confederate States Navy Stonewall, the CSS Stonewall. Uh, it was one of the very few Confederate ironclad ships to actually survive the war. Uh, it was obviously taken over in the U.S. Navy at the end of the war, sold to Japan, and, um, and it served in their fleet uh, very early on. So what you're seeing here is the Japanese attempting to acquire and build a modern industrial age Navy. Now, why is that important? This is the late 1860s, say 1870. Look what they're fielding just 30 years later. There is the next Azumo. And by the way, if you're interested, uh, look up the, uh, uh, the Azuma today. Uh, the current Azuma in the Japanese Navy, also known as the Maritime Self-Defense Force, it is basically an aircraft carrier. Now, for political purposes, they're calling it an anti-submarine warfare cruiser. It's an aircraft carrier. So the Azuma, uh, that name has a long history in the, uh, in the Japanese Navy. Uh, so here we have 1900. Now that ship was actually built in France. Up until this time, probably 1910, 1915, uh, Japanese shipyards and Japanese heavy industry had not yet matured to the point that they could build uh, anything larger than a small boat uh, destroyer type. Uh, certainly cruisers and battleships were gonna come primarily from British shipyards uh, or as in this case of this ship from a French shipyard. But I, I think that the difference is pretty profound between this one and this one. And it's only 30 years later. And there you have the Mikasa. This was the Japanese flagship uh, for the entire war and uh, particularly at Tsushima. Built in Britain uh, for the Imperial Japanese Navy, it was the Royal Sovereign class, the HMS Royal Sovereign class. In 1900, this was the state of the art in, uh, in battleship uh, design and building. And with that uh, indemnity, remember that, that indemnity uh, from China uh, that was actually funded by, uh, by the Russians in exchange for concessions in Manchuria, uh, that's what the Japanese used to buy these ships. And so there you have it. Uh, by the way, she's now uh, a museum ship in Yokosuka, Japan, uh, just outside the 
the naval station that's jointly used by the uh, uh, Japanese Navy and the U.S. Navy Pacific Fleet. So um, uh, if you happen to ever be in Japan, in, in the Yokosuka, Japan area, uh, this is well worth seeing. I'll show you a picture of her in, the, uh, uh, in her berth as a, uh, as a museum ship. Uh, so the Mikasa, uh, Japanese flagship, and by 1904, they had four of this class of ships. All right, now let me turn to what was going on that really led to the war, how it broke out, how it evolved. There is our Nicholas II, the last of the Romanov or Romanov uh, emperors, that's czar, that's what that means. Um, he was an interesting character. Uh, totally unsuited to be, uh, to be a ruler of anything more than maybe a restaurant. And that's no insult to restaurant owners. Uh, he just had no capability really to be ruling a major power. Uh, he was considered an unlucky ruler, uh, but he believed it was his destiny to expand um, the Russian empire into the East uh, and so when he became uh, czar in 1894, this was one of his uh, policy imperatives uh, was to push the uh, Russian empire into the East. Problem was Russia was a highly autocratic society, meaning that the word of the czar was it. Now there was a, a representative assembly that had really no teeth called the Duma, uh, but real power rested with the czar. So if you had a strong, powerful czar like, say, Peter the Great, or even Ivan the Terrible, or Catherine the Great, uh, you were doing fine. But if you had a weakling like Nicholas II, uh, you're going to have some problems. Essentially, the, uh, the kingdom was run like an imperial household. Uh, so there really was no representative uh, assembly, nor was there a, a cabinet that could take on responsibilities. There were cabinet ministers, but they didn't work together. They, they would uh, try to get the ear of the czar. And Nicholas was the kind of guy that he made a decision based on the last person to, to talk to him, what that person's opinion was. Uh, it, it also made corruption at a very high level very easy. So Russia was just unfortunately not blessed with a, a really good ruler. Nice guy, apparently, a real family man. Um, he did have some administrative talent, very little, and certainly was, was totally incapable of running something as large as the Russian Empire. So he relied heavily on this general, Count Sergei Vita, uh, who was a Russian minister. He was at various times the foreign minister um, or the minister of finance. So um, he really ran the government such as it was. He supported a, a pretty pragmatic and economic a desire to complete the Trans-Siberian Railroad all the way to Vladivostok, and that was started in uh, in 1891. And um, he advocated Russian dominance over Manchuria primarily uh, as an economic uh, resource, uh, uh, primary for re economy and resources. So I like this map, and let me point out a few things here. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think. We can see the northern part, but there you see the, uh, as it was completed, the Trans-Siberian Railway all the way to Vladivostok. But look at this spur down here. There is the Lautung Peninsula and there is Port Arthur. So remember that. Uh, Port Arthur down there, uh, there's Beijing or Peking, there's Vladivostok, there of course is Japan. So um, the Russians by 1904 had these two uh, naval bases one of the reasons why they had Port Arthur was in that 1894-95 war between China and Japan, China was forced to give up Port Arthur to Japan, who wanted to make a naval station there. But there was a lot of pressure. It actually was known as the Triple Intervention, uh, where uh, France, Germany, and uh, the Rus uh, France, Germany, and the Austrians pressured Japan into giving Port Arthur to the uh, uh, to the Russians. Well, you can imagine the Japanese reaction to that because they spent a lot of blood and treasure to get that. And so that's gonna be another bone of contention uh, between the, uh, the two imperial powers now, Russia and, uh, and Japan. 
I'll come back to this map because it's a, it's a good one. So I mentioned the Trans-Siberian Railway there and the various spurs. It was 5,500 miles of single track. And there's the problem. Single track means you can only go one way at a time. And because of this, typically only about uh, five pairs of trains per day could travel anywhere on the Trans-Siberian Railway. It also was light rail, uh, which meant you didn't have as powerful uh, locomotives, as heavy a locomotives. And so in some points it could barely make uh, seven, eight miles per hour. And another aspect, and again, I don't think you can see this, uh, maybe you can, but up around here is Lake Baikal. Now, eventually they had a spur line that went around the lake, but initially uh, it, the uh, railway line stopped at the shore of the lake. And if it was wintertime, you could walk across or take a sled across. Um, in the summertime, you did go by boat, but the point was you had to stop get on some other form of transportation and pick it up on the other side. The problem in terms of the war, once it broke out, is this railway was only capable of transporting about 20,000 troops per month. So if the Russians are gonna reinforce here in Manchuria, as I say, they can only move in 20,000 troops a month. That's going to have a, um, a heavy influence on how they actually craft their war strategy, as you will see very shortly. Well, that is what a Europe more or less looked like. This is Europe in 1914, but it really hadn't changed all that much uh, other than uh, the, uh, the Ottomans had been pretty well whacked around in, uh, in this area here and we're in retreat. But that's essentially what Europe looked like in 1904. And if you look at this border here, there's Imperial Germany, there is Imperial Russia, and there's the Austro-Hungarian Empire. They all border on each other and they don't like each other. And so the, the biggest concern in Russia, here's, um, you can't see it it's behind here, but there's uh, St. Petersburg um, and down here is Moscow. The big concern is Germany and Austria-Hungary. And so what you see is as a potential for war in the East with the China, uh, Japan is beginning to, to bubble up. Here's what General Alexei Kuropatkin, uh, when he was war minister in 1900 commented uh, on getting sucked into a war uh, with the Japanese. He said, quote, to the delight of Germany in directing our attention to the East, we are giving her and Austria a decisive preponderance of forces and material over us. Uh, in 1903, uh, the uh, a chief of the naval staff argued that Russia should just send in a bunch of small craft to sort of defend their interests there, but uh, essentially focus their naval power uh, in the Baltic up here, the Black Sea and the North Sea. So the Russian high command is not at all thrilled with the prospects of a war with Japan because they're very much concerned about potential for war with uh, Germany and Austria-Hungary. Well, what else? Uh, the quality of the forces uh, there in the East is really not good at all. 98,000, but they're second line troops, mostly older, less well-trained, less well-equipped. Now, overall, the Russian forces are pretty, uh, pretty robust. 1.1 million active duty and 4.4 million reserve troops. Um, so that's over 5 million altogether. But as I just pointed out, uh, and, or you can extrapolate from what I said about the, uh, the thinking in Moscow, obviously the best troops, the best formations are stationed in Europe. Uh, the, the Russians are really pretty hesitant to, um, to send their first line troops off into the East where they might just simply be trapped you know, in a useless war with Japan. So this is going to lead essentially to a purely defensive strategy of hold until reinforced, hold until reinforced. And that is going to give the strategic initiative to Japan. And what I mean by strategic initiative is whoever has got the offensive, whoever is taking actions that essentially move things along and the opponent is just simply a force to react to that. So, this is because of all this, 
the, the nature of the land forces is going to dictate that. Well, let me turn now to the uh, Russian Imperial Navy. Uh, their fleet was actually pretty good, uh, but it was separated into three separate fleets. Uh, the Black Sea Squadron, which was pretty well locked into the Black Sea simply because the Turks uh, would not allow them to, to transit the Straits there. Uh, but they did have um, in the Port Arthur area, uh, seven battleships and six cruisers. So that squadron was actually fairly robust, at least in numbers. And then up in Vladivostok, they had a squadron of four cruisers. Most of the naval assets were actually uh, based out of St. Petersburg, and that would be the Baltic fleet. So there you see it, um, two heavily fortified Pacific stations at Port Arthur and Vladivostok. One of the problems with Port Arthur was uh, they were originally planning to build a ring around on the landward side of fortifications, 28 of them I think was the number, and by 1904 there were only four completed. So you're going to see that play into this shortly. Uh, but there you see what the Port Arthur squadron uh, looked like. One of the things that really drove the Japanese decision for its war now or never was this point down here that the Russians were actually building five new battleships that were destined to go to the Pacific fleet. Well. Once the war did start, and I need to mention what were Russia's political objectives, uh, which I think are sort of interesting. This is their, this was their policy objectives for the war. Destroy the Japanese Navy, totally disarm Japan, disavow all treaties, make Japan merely a, uh, the army, merely a constabulary force, uh, change the whole Japanese regime, the government, uh, and end all Japanese continental ambitions. <laughs> uh, that's pretty robust. Uh, the emperor, uh, Nicholas II, actually envisioned landing and invading Japan and essentially conquering it. So pretty, uh, pretty interesting policy objectives. In terms of uh, Russian strategic assumptions as the war started, the first thing was to preserve the naval strength. In other words, keep that Port Arthur squadron uh, intact until it was ready to deliver a decisive blow to the Japanese fleet. They also assumed that the squadron would be safe in the anchorages, defended by those land fortifications, but remember, they weren't yet complete. And once you, once you move in troops even slowly, as you build up your force, eventually you're going to simply overwhelm Japan. So it's a hold until reinforced uh, kind of a, a strategic war plan. So key point, preserve naval power in East Asia, uh, fight a holding action in Korea. If you got pushed out of Korea, you just simply back up into Manchuria. Uh, if you lose there, you just simply go back, go back, go back, because eventually the attrition of the smaller power Japan is going to wear them out and they're, they'll be subject to a, a counteroffensive by, uh, by the Russians. That is their hold until uh, reinforced or hold until relieved uh, type of uh, strategic mentality. Well, let me turn now to Japan. You see quite a contrast here. Standing army, active duty, uh, 200,000, 600,000 reserves. So you're looking at a force balance of 5.5 million Russians to 800,000 Japanese. Um, however, they had adopted that Prussian, particularly the German general staff system. And that of course is going to give them a, a lot more efficient uh, planning and operational execution as the Russians will sadly find out shortly. So how about the Imperial Navy? Well, I mentioned that they had the best built uh, state-of-the-art British ships available. Um, they used that indemnity to purchase it. They had six new battleships of the Mikasa class. Um, I'm sorry, four of the Mikasa class and two of another one and six uh, armored cruisers, which uh, say in World War II, those would be known as heavy cruisers. Uh, so the naval balance is more or less balanced, but it's going uh, to be temporary. 
Uh, if the Japanese wait long enough, uh, what will happen is those five new battleships will arrive and the, and the balance of power is going to change dramatically. So think about this in terms of World War II and Pearl Harbor and Japanese thinking that it's now or never. We've got to attack now or never because the balance of forces is going to, to go heavily against us. So that's part of their, their thinking in 1904. And you're gonna see it's part of their thinking in 1941 as well. So there you see it. Um, the Japanese Navy, I mentioned was British trained and equipped. Many Japanese officers had served aboard Royal Navy uh, warships. A huge weakness was they couldn't replace losses quickly. Um, certainly they couldn't build anything larger than destroyers, but even if they were gonna purchase, how long is it gonna to take to get there? So what they needed was a quick, decisive victory or a QDV. One of the things that did play in their favor was uh, they had what we would call internal lines of communication, uh, meaning that they were based right there in the area and they could literally uh, get a ship underway from Yokosuka or Tokyo and be on station uh, literally within hours. Certainly the Russians could not do that. So the distance from the home ports was very important uh, uh, operationally and particularly for uh, logistical sustainment uh, of the troops uh, ashore. Well, there's the Katori class battleship. Uh, they had two of these, not quite as good as the Mikasa class, but certainly uh, qualitatively uh, very, very good. There, by the way, is Admiral Togo, Vice Admiral Togo. And there is the Emperor, known as the Mikado. Now, August 1903, uh, tension is rising between Japan and, uh, and the Russians over uh, this uh, potential conflict uh, over Manchuria and Korea. And so uh, the Japanese proposed uh, an agreement called the Mancor Exchange the Mancor Exchange, pretty simple agreement, uh, actually. Japan will be preponderant in uh, Korea as their sphere of influence. The Russians would be preponderant in Manchuria, but each side had an open door to conduct trade in the other's sphere of influence. And of course, to all troops uh, would be removed from uh, both the spheres of influence. Well, the Russians didn't respond right away to this diplomatic overture, uh, the Japanese saw that as stalling tactic when actually what was going on was the, uh, the Russian government was, was so um, disorganized and inefficient that, um, and indecisive that uh, no answer ever came back. So uh, the Japanese, as I say, took this as uh, uh, stalling tactics. Well, the talks broke down by early 1904. So on the 13th of January, Japan issued its final offer uh, and sent a message that, quote, further delay in the solution of the questions will be extremely disadvantageous to the two countries, end quote. And they broke off negotiations on the 4th of February and then a surprise naval attack on the Russian naval station at Port Arthur happened on the night of the 8th of February. So there is your strategic surprise. So what about this attack on Port Arthur, on the Russian squadron? The night of 8 to 9, February 1904, uh, the attack was uh, seen as crucial. Um, Japan saw its only chance of, of winning uh, is dealing a, a pretty deadly blow against the Russian uh, squadron there with the surprise attack. Uh, it carried a lot of risks because uh, uh, the Japanese Navy, even though it was very good by this time, it still was relatively small. This is an interesting uh, painting. And I, why it is so interesting to me is if you didn't already know that these were Japanese sailors, and if I asked you, well, what Navy is this? You would likely say, well, it could be the British Royal Navy. Uh, looks like it might even be the French Navy. And I think uh, the, the point here is this emphasizes just how westernized the Japanese Navy and Army was by this time. Compare that to feudal Japan, the samurai, if you've ever seen samurai armor, uh, that whole uh, uh, feudal culture, military culture. 
tremendous change in Japan in just literally 50 years. Well, one of the things that Admiral Togo, uh, Vice Admiral Togo, who commanded the, uh, the fleet, uh, he, did, he was a risk taker up to a point. So he only sent in 10 uh, destroyer, what we would call destroyers, or then they were called tor destroyer torpedo boats. Um, they did some damage, but they didn't completely knock out the, the Port Arthur squadron. And so that left it pretty much intact. And that's going to affect how the land war plays out. So for the landing, the Japanese uh, landed in uh, five different places along the coast. There's Port Arthur. Here's Vladivostok up here, uh, uncontested. Because remember the Russian overall strategy is to main the, uh, maintain the Port Arthur uh, squadron intact, uh, to not risk it until they had built up sufficient forces to be able to start their uh, counteroffensive. Uh, so essentially these Japanese landings were uncontested and unmolested, and that allowed them to push any Russians out of Korea and back into Manchuria, where there was a whole series of land battles. The most famous, most decisive was this one, the Battle of Mukden. I'll talk a little bit about that. So once they landed, what do they do? Well, they had a couple of options. Um, they could make a primary thrust against Port Arthur down here because the Port Arthur squadron is still around, or they could drive into Manchuria, or they could divide their forces and that's exactly what they did. They sent a large army down to besiege Port Arthur and they uh, sent their other army to push the Russians back out of Manchuria. And they did pretty well. Uh, there was one battle along the Yalu River, uh, which is that border between uh, uh, Manchuria and, uh, and Korea. And one of the things that came out of the, uh, the Russian route uh, on the Yalu River was up until this time, British and American banks had been unwilling to loan money to Japan. Everyone just assumed, well, the Russians, the big Russian bear is gonna eat the, the Japanese for lunch and it'll all be over quick. So why should we loan money to Japan? Well, very similar to what happened over here with the War of Independence, once the Continental Army defeated a large British army at Saratoga, uh, that convinced the French and then later the Spanish that, holy smokes, these guys might win or could win. Therefore, we're going to support them. Well, this is exactly what happened after the, the route of the Russian army on the Yalu River uh, is uh, not only did it move the war into Manchuria fully, but it also caused uh, British and U.S. banks to be willing to loan money to, uh, uh, to the uh, Japanese government. Well, the Russian Navy, uh, they did finally come out in August of 1904, uh, and they had an Admiral uh, Makarov or Makarov, who was probably their best commanding officer, and he was uh, very aggressive. He said, essentially, to hell with this stay in port. We're going to go out and confront the Japanese on the high seas, the Battle of the Yellow Sea, 10 August 1904. Well, unfortunately for uh, Admiral Makarov, um, his ship hit a flagship hit a mine and sank, taking him down. So after that point, literally until it was destroyed by the Japanese, the Port Arthur squadron literally set uh, at anchor in Port Arthur, uh, bottled up. And by the way, there is the Mikasa uh, set in a concrete berth and there is a statue of, of Admiral Togo. There's the Yellow Sea, again, there's Port Arthur. So by the fall of 1904, Japan is pretty desperately short of, of manpower after all the fighting. Uh, after the, um, uh, the initial setbacks, the uh, Tsarist government decided to detach or dispatch the Baltic fleet to the Pacific. Now this was a transit of over 20,000 miles. And one of the big problems for uh, the Russian fleet is obtaining coal this time all these ships were coal fired. Uh, the French allowed them to coal up in uh, uh, Madagascar and also in I think it was Camran Bay, which those of you who remember the Vietnam era, that's a familiar sound, but it's a naval station. Um, 
So essentially, the main or only concern of this fleet as it transited through 1904, early 1905, was just to keep steaming, which meant that uh, battle efficiency uh, was pretty much ignored. The training of the crews weren't all that good to start with, and the battle proficiency uh, was at a very low level. You're going to see how that plays out here uh, eventually. So the Japanese then, they've taken half their force roughly, and they're going to besiege Port Arthur, try to capture that. And this is a fascinating uh, picture. It shows one of these giant howitzer guns that they mounted up, up on a hilltop overlooking Port Arthur, but it's been colorized. So they besieged Port Arthur, it lasted for several weeks. The end result is that. The last thing you want to have happen to you if you're a commanding officer of a warship is to have your ship sunk in harbor at anchor by land-based artillery. And that's exactly what happened. So there's a photograph of one of the Port Arthur Squadron ships after uh, the bombardment. Here you see Japanese officers looking down. You see the various uh, warships sunk or capsizing. Um, Japan's credit rating uh, obviously skyrocketed after this. Um, and in Russia, it created one of the first events uh, of the Russian Revolution that uh, broke out again in 1917. And it was known as the Revolution of 1905. Uh, there was tremendous discontent in Russia, uh, primarily based on the economy and, and food, but it really is one of the first um, events of that uh, eventual Russian Revolution. So with that, with all this internal discontent, with the loss of the Port Arthur Squadron, uh, and, and also the Battle of Mukden, which is gonna happen very shortly, uh, the Russian government decides mm, might be time for war termination. There's just another picture of sunken uh, Russian warships at Port Arthur. Why Mukden? Well, Japan needed a victory. Um, they had been fighting on several fronts. They'd lost about 25% casualties. Remember from the numbers, they didn't have all that many to start with. Uh, and so by this time, uh, even though it was slow, 20,000 troops a month, Russian troops and better troops were in fact filtering into uh, the theater. And Japan realized uh, they needed to have a major victory and force the Russians to the negotiating table. And so they massed all of their forces that they could get and they attacked the Russians at a place called Mukden and thoroughly thrashed the Russians. This is a very interesting uh, picture here. If you look very carefully, you can see it looks like a series of panels. And that's exactly what they are. They're roughly uh, eight by four, or they might be even a little larger, kind of like a sheetrock panel size. Well, this is the age where motion pictures are just beginning to come online. Uh, photography is there and it's great, but one of the ways that the Japanese used to tell the story to the public uh, was by this whole series of panels. And of course here you see it depicts the heroic victorious Japanese forces just simply overwhelming the drunken cowardly Russian. You get the whole propaganda idea here. Uh, but clearly um, this is how you told the story to the public and how you uh, propped up or, or motivated uh, public opinion in support of the war. So the, the battle at Mukden, very, very important for Japan because it's one of those key things followed very shortly uh, by the Battle of Tsushima Straits um, that you're gonna see next that convinced the Russians it's time to quit. Well, I mentioned the Vladivostok squadron earlier, uh, four cruisers, three of them actually went on a sortie in June of 1904 just for about three or four weeks. They did so much damage to Japanese shipping and commercial shipping that all sailing traffic between Japan and the west coast of the United States and Canada was shut down. Why was it shut down? Because of maritime insurance rates. Uh, we've all heard of Lloyd's of London, the maritime insurer. 
wasn't the only company insuring maritime, but if they set the lead, everybody followed. Well, Lloyd's of London, realizing just how many ships had been attacked and sunk around uh, Japan by just three cruisers, three cruisers out of Vladivostok, that they stopped all trade, insurance companies raised the maritime rates, uh, and actually some of the uh, Japanese troop ships were attacked and sunk by just three cruisers on a three to four week cruise. My point here is that had the Russians been more aggressive with their naval assets, they could have completely undone Japan, um, completely uh, eliminated any possibility of, of uh, reinforcing or resupplying that uh, force uh, in uh, Manchuria or Korea. Another interesting thing is this is the Aurora. Uh, she played a huge role in the Russian Revolution. You don't know that story. She was one of actually only four ships, Russian ships that survived the Battle of Tsushima in May of 1905. And uh, in 1917, she was anchored at St. Petersburg. This is the ship that threatened to, turned her guns and threatened to shell um, uh, the government. And uh, uh, I'm not sure which building it was, but it was basically the headquarters now of the of the Russian government. Uh, and so it forced the, the, uh, the Russian government in 1917 to collapse. So this ship has a storied history. And if you go to St. Petersburg on that Viking Baltic homelands cruise, a little bit of marketeering there, if you go on the Viking homelands, Viking homelands cruise with Viking cruise lines, and you make a port visit in St. Petersburg, you might even get to go on board the Aurora. She is a museum ship. So uh, quite, a, quite a story here behind this one ship. All right, so there is the Straits of Tsushima. So the Russian Baltic fleet steamed 25,000 miles all the way around to reinforce the, uh, what was left of the Pacific fleet um, in poor combat readiness, pretty poor combat readiness. So the Battle of Tsushima Strait, 27 to 28 May, 1905. As I mentioned earlier, the Japanese, they needed a quick, decisive victory, and they got it. Of the 38 Russian ships engaged, 34 were sunk. That is the most thorough defeat of a naval force, I think, in the history of the world. Japan lost only three small torpedo boats and 110 sailors. The Russians lost almost 5,000 killed and 6,000 prisoners. And of course, all of their battleships and all of their uh, larger cruisers were lost, four ships only remained. So the Russian naval power all over the world is pretty much wiped out. Uh, there's a, a good painting of Admiral Togo and his staff on the bridge of the Mikasa. Um, and this battle really validated the naval theory that said uh, you win command of the sea uh, by decisive action between great battle fleets. And certainly this battle would, would verify or justify that. I love this, that's a postcard. It actually is a postcard. And um, since I know most people uh, don't um, uh, read the Japanese, I'll translate that for you. It is a postcard uh, written by Admiral Togo in 1932 after he had retired. So let me translate it for, for you. It says, having a great time in Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, wish you were here. Okay, usually I get a laugh on that. I can't tell if you're chuckling, but I sure hope you are. All right, so after Muck Den, um, it's time to end the war. And who is the one who facilitates this? None other than, none other than President Theodore Roosevelt. The Japanese were very clever in their war termination. They planned it in concert with the war plans. And actually, even before the first shot was fired, they already had in place a war termination plan. Baron Kaneko, who was the uh, Japanese ambassador or an ambassador, was uh, actually sent to Washington, DC, um, good friend of President Roosevelt, uh, and Kaneko was basically laying the groundwork. Uh, now, Roosevelt was a good candidate because to mediate the treaty because he had a very favorable attitude towards Japan as did most people in uh, Great Britain and the United States at this time, 
uh, and a very poor attitude towards uh, the Russians, as did most people in the United States and uh, Great uh, Britain at the time. So uh, they got together and at the Portsmouth uh, Naval Shipyard, which actually is in uh, uh, Kittery, Maine, it's not in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, but it straddles the border. Uh, they got together in that treaty room, interestingly enough, uh, is still around. You can, you can actually go in and see the treaty room. Well, um, Baron, uh, or sorry, Count uh, Vita was the Russian uh, chief negotiator. Japan really only had three overarching core unalterable conditions. Uh, one was that Russia acknowledged a Japanese domination over Korea. Port Arthur would go to Japan, uh, as well as any uh, Russian naval assets that remain. And the South Manchurian Railway will go over to Japan. I don't think that's a whole lot of, uh, of uh, unalterable demands or core demands. Now they did have some other ones um, like some indemnity and whatever, but uh, their plan was to go in and give up a lot, give up a lot if they had to in order to get those core demands, which in fact they did. Uh, the Russians interestingly enough uh, came to uh, Kittery, Maine, Portsmouth Naval Shipyard in August of 1905, and they didn't really de view themselves as a, a defeated power, uh, which was kind of interesting because they had been thrashed over and over and over again. Uh, there's Count Vita, the, the chief negotiator. And I love this, uh, this picture here. That's the Japanese delegation. They don't really look like, expression-wise, that they won a war, a major war, when no one expected them to. Uh, I guess that's just that oriental inscrutability that they're trying to project there. But nonetheless, they got what they came for. Uh, they ended the war. And now uh, Japan is regarded as a great power. Um, people are taking them seriously from this point on. So to wrap it up, uh, Japan managed to wage a successful limited war they kept it from uh, escalating out of control against a much stronger, or at least on the, the books, much stronger power. Um, and so how does a, a, a weaker power actually win? How do they do this? Well, dictate the nature of the war. Um, they won the strategic initiative very early on, primarily because they were very aggressive, but also because the Russians, by their hold until uh, reinforced, strategy, uh, put them on the defensive against a very aggressive and very capable Japan right away. Um, and they also had realistic expectations, as you, you see from their objectives that I gave. It wasn't a march into Moscow, march into the Kremlin, and depose the Tsar. Well, that's what he had in mind for Japan, but their objectives were pretty limited and pretty rational and achievable. Uh, and so I think if you look at uh, all the dynamics of the Russo-Japanese War, um, that's how a, a minor power or a lesser power can actually defeat a greater one. So uh, that leads on to the 1920s and 30s. As Japan is on the Allied side. There are actually uh, Japanese Navy destroyers operating in the Mediterranean uh, against the, uh, the Germans and the Austro-Hungarians. Uh, the Japanese felt that they were shortchanged with the Treaty of Versailles that ended World War I, that they weren't given enough credit. They actually did kick the Germans out of China uh, and the Pacific Islands. What they did get were the Mandate Islands, like the Marshalls, the Marianas. And oh, by the way, now we go down to the 1940s and World War II, they have fortified all those. And so if you look at World War II, the Central Pacific campaign going across the Pacific aimed at the Japanese home islands. Uh, they're coming up against these largely former Ger uh, German possessions that Japan has obtained after the war and has fortified and uh, created this uh, uh, defensive ring. Um, and the other lesson that the Japanese took from it is the way to start a war against a greater power, particularly one that can bring a lot more power into the field as time goes by, is to knock out their, uh, their power initially uh, by surprise of naval attack.
that happened at Port Arthur in 1904. And that's their thinking as to how to do it. And that's what's going to lead on to the Pearl Harbor attack of December 7, 1941. So that all fits into this theme of the rise of Imperial Japan and, and the rise particularly of uh, Japanese naval power. So with that, Britta, I think we're ready for any questions. All right. Let's see, the first question, what future lectures are planned by Professor Carpenter and will any be in person COVID permitting? Okay. <laughs> um, hope so, hope so, hint, hint, hint. South King's mm -hmm. on public library. Um, Britta, you haven't mentioned this, but uh, I think, well, at least a couple of months ago, the thinking was, um, yeah, we can go back to live lectures, and I have done that at a few places. Um, but the problem is you have to space so many people out or, or so many spaces between people that you can't get everybody in the room. And, and the idea of still doing a Zoom lecture was so we could maximize the number of potential audience. Is that a fair assessment? Yes, at least at our library, the limit is 20 people and there's more than 20 people in this meeting. So yeah. more people are able to see. Yeah, and we, and we had, I think for the first lecture, we had 40. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, so it, that was just a decision to, to maximize the number. Is there any thinking on when we might be able to go back live without these restrictions? I'm not sure, hopefully sooner than later, but right now um, we went back to wearing masks inside and we have the same limitations. Um, so I'm not sure, I don't have a date in mind yeah. for that, but hopefully soon. Do you well, have what any other Zoom um, sessions? Yeah, um, what do I got? The, the next one up that uh, I know a lot of folks in the audience also do the, uh, the uh, Osher Lifelong Learning Institute at URI. Mm -hmm. uh, that's going to be, I don't have the calendar for me. I think that's in April or May. Uh, and I'm not sure what the topic is. Uh, but if, if those of you who are members of OLLI, just keep an eye on that because there is another four part session coming up uh, sometime later this spring. As far as at South Kingstown, um, presumably it'll be about this time next year. Don't know what the topic will be. We have to work that out. Uh, and in, um, in the fall, I'll be uh, at um, Warwick Public Library, which did go live this, this past uh, uh, autumn because they have a much larger room and they can fit them in. So uh, keep an eye on that, uh, Warwick Public Library. Um, but as far as Zoom lectures lined up, uh, there aren't any at the moment that aren't specific to some historical association. In other words, they're not open to the public. They're specific to some group or institution. But those two, keep an eye on them, Ollie and uh, Warwick Public Library. All right, I'll, while you're answering this next question, I will look at the Ollie calendar and see if I can find those dates and send them in the chat. Okay, All right, so the next question, what were the infantry weapons of the Japanese military taking Seoul? Uh, the military weapons, um, pretty much like what they had in World War uh, II, the bolt action um, uh, rifle. So you had to basically do the bolt to eject the cartridge and come in with the next one. Uh, they might have had some Mauser 98 type, type 98 uh, rifle as well, because uh, uh, importing from Germany. Um, that's the, the basic infantry weapon was a, a a, a bolt action rifle. Uh, in terms of the artillery, well, you saw a picture there. That, that was the state of artillery. And if you think about just what, 50 years earlier, 40, 35 years earlier, uh, what kind of artillery they had in the American Civil War, it was the old Napoleonic gun, the old smooth bore tube mounted on a couple of wagon wheels. Look at the difference. This is the Industrial Revolution. Look at the difference between that and what the Japanese were using to bombard uh, Port Arthur. Um, so artillery was a, a heavy weapon. They would have had cavalry. Um, cavalry was still around, although not really used against infantry, uh, up against machine guns. It was more for scouting and reconnaissance, but they would typically carry a carbine type weapon and maybe a sword. Um, no aircraft. Aircraft wouldn't have been around. 
machine guns were certainly very prominent by this time. Uh, and you're, you're beginning to see very much a modern type machine gun. So those were the essential weapons that you would have seen uh, carried by the army or used by the army. And what was the evolution of the infantry weapons from 1850 through the Russian conflict? Okay, 1850, uh, the basic infantry weapon, uh, let's say the United States was the Springfield rifle. In Britain, it was the Enfield rifle. Uh, two differences between the old uh, flintlock weapons. One, it was rifle. Uh, industrial machine uh, manufacturing had reached a point where you could actually uh, cut the grooves in rifling fairly easily. Whereas in the previous century, you had to hand turn them very slowly. And that was why there were very few rifles. Um, it still looked an awful lot like an old fashioned musket. Big difference is in 1850, it was used a percussion cap, which uh, was just a little, uh, usually made out of brass and it had fulminative mercury uh, in it. And when the hammer would come down, it would hit that fulminate of mercury, which would cause it to blast and that would set off the, uh, the powder charge. Still was a pour the powder down the barrel uh, primary weapon, although there were some breech loading weapons coming along about the 1860 or so. Um, so you're beginning to get uh, breech loading uh, and you're also getting uh, uh, metal cartridges. But 1850, they were still like the old fight off the end, pour the powder down. Um, by uh, this time, 1900 or so, as I said earlier, you've got the uh, standard infantry weapon, which was a, a bolt action uh, rifle. If you're familiar with the Springfield rifle, 1903 model, that by the way, is still one of the finest weapons ever manufactured. Um, think of that, a, a bolt action, uh, single shot with a, a magazine of, uh, well, let's see, the Enfield, the British, uh, Enfield rifle could do a magazine of 10. So typically five to 10 rounds before you had to put in a new magazine. But again, bolt action, you had to do the bolt to eject the cartridge, the, the brass. And then when you shut it again, that would bring up another round into the, into the breech. So that's the, the transition from black powder, um, musketry essentially, uh, all the way to modern riflery, just in that period. What was the state of communication technology throughout the war? How did, if at all, Port Arthur communicate their predicament? Well, they would have communicated uh, typically by telegraph uh, and then over the sea, underwater cable. Underwater cables for telegraph, that went all the way back to the 1850s and 60s. So that was a pretty robust uh, way. Uh, in terms of RT, radio telegraphy, uh, meaning radio waves, it was in its infancy, didn't really become um, a characteristic of particularly warships at sea until a few years later. Uh, so communications at sea, um, well, really like it is today when you shut off your radios, it was flashing light signal flags. Um, but communications say from the, the army uh, in Korea or Manchuria back to Tokyo would have been by, uh, by telegraph. How did Japan do so well at the Korean Strait? How did Japan do so well in the, in the what now? At the Korean Strait. Oh, oh, you mean Tsushima. I think that's what you mean. You mean the, the uh, yeah, it's also known as the Korean Strait uh, oh. because it separates Korea and Japan. Well, one thing is pretty obvious um, is the Russians are just simply worn out. They just sailed 25,000 miles um, they had to, because of the coaling problem, uh, they basically had big sacks of coal piled up on the decks and over everywhere. And so that inhibited doing any training, maintenance, all those sorts of things. So by the time they arrived uh, there at Tsushima, uh, the crews were out of practice, ill-trained, exhausted, and just 
not really combat ready. Japanese, on the other hand, were fully up to speed, well-trained, well-drilled, uh, certainly not, uh, not exhausted because uh, their, their home ports were just only a few hours steaming away. Um, and so I think that was uh, the biggest difference. Qualitatively in comparing the ships, uh, I think the, the Japanese British built ships were probably a little bit better, but not enough to explain how do you wipe out a, a 34 of a 38 uh, ship force so easily. So I think the big thing is uh, that and, and the motivation of the, of the forces, the average sailor in the Russian fleet and army soldier uh, would be a conscript peasant. Um, and in fact, uh, the sort of an anecdote uh, of, uh, of old Russia, uh, that whenever a village was required to send a man off to the army, uh, the village would give him his funeral before he left because they never expected him to come back or see him again. And so I think just the attitude uh, of the, uh, and motivation and dedication uh, of the individual uh, soldier or sailor was probably a lot lower uh, than the Japanese. So you put all those factors together and I think that explains why it was such a dramatic victory. Great. Um, this is four of your seven lectures in the Rise and Fall series. Any hope that we can hear the other three? So I guess if you have the other three scheduled anywhere else? Well, shucks, yeah. Maybe, uh, maybe for next, uh, next year's round. We can oh. do the other three, plus I'll, I'll throw in a fourth one um, yeah. to make it a four-parter. So that's probably probably what we'll do. Yeah. Um, the other ones I to, uh, let's see, Rise and I did Japan, I did uh, Greece, I did Rome, and I did Napoleon, right? Yep. So I have the, um, uh, what else do I have? 1918, the collapse of Imperial Germany. So that's the last year of World War I. Um, I've got the Franco-Prussian War, Bismarck, von Moltke, Franco-Prussian War, 1870-71, uh, the rise of Imperial Germany. I've got one on the uh, uh, French-Algerian War, which a lot of Americans are not familiar with, but that really was the last gasp of the, of the French empire uh, and the creation of an independent Algeria. Uh, that's the 1950s. And then I can come up with a, a fourth one. So yeah, let's, let's plan on that. The other part of the rise and fall of empires. So that'll be next winter. So stand mm -hmm. by for that. Which right. that answers question number one that we had a few mm. minutes ago. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Another question. Aside from allying with the U.S., what strategic measures is Japan planning to counter to China's growing presence? Do you mean today? Well, one of my very good friends is retired Admiral Yoji Koda. Uh, his last billet or his last um, uh, tour, I guess we'll call it, he was the commander in chief of the, of the fleet. And so those of you that know World War II history, uh, this would be the same position as yet. Yeah, Admiral Yamamoto had. So commander in chief for the combined fleet, the operational fleet. So Admiral Kota was that um, before he retired. He comes over here all the time. Uh, if there's any event going at Pearl Harbor, um, he's there speaking. Uh, he spent a couple of years uh, uh, on a fellowship at Harvard. He comes to the Naval War College all the time, loves to come to the state. And he's very frank about Japan's future and past and why things happen, whatever. His concept is what is going to happen with Japan, primarily because of the China question, is very soon you're going to see um, this whole idea of a of maritime self-defense force. It's going to go away. It's the Imperial Japanese Navy. They have an emperor, it's a navy, and they're Japanese. Um, and one of the things that you're beginning to see is uh, Japan, the ships going about beyond that thousand mile restriction that was laid on them in the constitution of uh, post-war World War II. Uh, so they're, they're operating. In fact, they come here every year, every summer uh, 
Uh, there are a couple of Japanese warships that come to make a port visit uh, at uh, Naval Station Newport. And um, so I, what Admiral Kota says is that as the concern for China uh, evolves and has been growing for a while, what you're seeing is Japan basically remilitarizing. Uh, the big difference is I'm damn glad they're on our side this time uh, uh, because well, we know the, the history of World War II and, and what they can do. Um, the other thing that's happening, and I alluded to this with the Azuma, is they're starting to build up their capital force. Um, they have two, maybe even a third one on the way, uh, what are called ASW cruisers. The reason why they do that is by law in the constitution, they can't have aircraft carriers. Well, you look at them, they're aircraft carriers because the idea in anti-submarine warfare is you use anti-submarine aircraft, particularly helicopters. Um, and uh, so that's what they're armed with, the anti-submarine helicopters. But the reality is you can fly uh, aircraft off these, the vertical, uh, like the Harrier or the, uh, the F-35 variant that, that literally lifts up and go. I saw this in the Mediterranean in 1982 off USS Nassau, just to prove it could be done. Uh, they put all the helicopters in the hangar deck and we operated 20 Marine Corps Harriers the vertical lift Harriers. So that basically became a, a, a fixed wing aircraft carrier. That's what the Japanese are doing. And, um, and uh, so I think you're gonna see some, some dramatic changes, growth in the, the Japanese Navy as a, a counter or a reaction to, to Chinese uh, uh, provocations and the growth of the Chinese Navy. Looks like the last question is, how did Japan manage to lift those huge artillery weapons in the heights over Port Arthur? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, now, obviously, they would have had a few uh, trolleys and engines and that sort of thing, but a lot of it's just human and animal muscle power. Um, but yeah, that's that hill is... I think it's a hill 231 was one of the primary. So that would have been 231 meters tall, which is what about 203, six to seven, 800 feet tall. That was a pretty substantial heft to get those things up there. But I think it probably would have been largely uh, animal uh, muscle power and some human, and they might have used some, some type of primitive machines. All right, I think that was the last question. Okay. Anything else? Um, I'm looking at some of the uh, some of the chats here. Let me see if there's anything there real quick. Uh, somebody did laugh. Excellent. Uh, yeah. You win the prize tonight. Okay. Yeah, that's one of the problems with doing a Zoom is say I don't get any. I can't see any of you except Britta. So I don't know. Uh, what the reactions are, and it makes it very difficult to do this, but it's what we do. Um, let's see, aside from allowing with the US, what strategic measures Japan planning? I think I addressed that fairly well. Um, Japan is dependent upon a blue water Navy, China can't match it. Uh, yes, very much so. Uh, the Japanese ships, uh, in fact, they, they use a lot of our technology, um, particularly uh, our um, Arleigh Burke class ships, if you look at the Japanese destroyers, they look very much like ours. So there's a lot of compatibility there. We can very easily, the, the, the three navies in the world that the United States Navy can just mesh right in with and operate, obviously the British Royal Navy, the Royal Australian Navy, and the Japanese Imperial Navy or Japanese Navy. Uh, I mean, we, we have perfected or worked these uh, techniques and technology. And so you literally can put them all four together and sail off. And they just did that um, with the um, uh, battle group based around the uh, HMS Queen Elizabeth, uh, the new British uh, carrier. Um, so uh, China can't match it. They're getting better, but technologically and in every other ways, uh, I think the Japanese are, are far, far and away ahead of the, the uh, Chinese. Okay.
I think that's uh, that's it, isn't it, Britta? Yep, there's just a few thank yous. and. Yes, I said thank you very much for everybody. I uh, hope this has been enjoyable as usual and uh, look forward to seeing some of you at Lolly and uh, just, just keep an eye on these public libraries because uh, they, they pop in and out, but certainly we'll go for next January timeframe. Yeah, hopefully uh, maybe in person, we'll stand yeah, by on that. Hopefully in person and, uh, and Warwick Public Library uh, this autumn, if, if you wanna go that far. Okay. All right, thank you so much. All right, thank you very much then. See everybody, have a safe winter. Good night, everyone.